So I have this photo that was taken right here in the spot that I'm standing in right now about 119 years ago. All this space was open. There was like a split rail fence that ran alongside the road. Telephone poles weren't here. The guardrail wasn't here. That culvert down by the stream wasn't there. That little speed warning light thingamajigger wasn't there. All of this was just wide open. You could see the brook. You could see some apple trees up over there and you could see our house and our barn. I find this picture remarkable because so much of the land and so much of the surrounding area has changed around our house. But structures like our house and our barn have really hung around and stuck around for the last hundred and nearly 20 years. My name is Morgan Gold and this, all of this collectively is Goldshaw Farm. So to the best of my knowledge, our farm was originally settled by a guy by the name of John Hendry. Um, he came here in the 1820s. I think he built the original house. The house was originally built as one and a half stories. To the best of my knowledge, John Hendry essentially homesteaded here and then ultimately became a sheep farmer here. You know, in the 1800s, sheep farming was like the dominant industry here in Vermont. Um, in fact, most of the state was pretty much clear cut and, and it had been turned into pasture. And when you think about all the trees and, and kind of the scenery here in Vermont right now and how wooded the state actually is, 170 years ago, the state looked drastically different. So anyway, John Hendry was a farmer here. In fact, the brook that's down over on the south side of the property, that's actually called Hendry's Brook. I believe that would be named after John Hendry. He ultimately sold the place though. And when he sold the place, a family by the name of Shaw took it over. So in the 1870s, Richard and Hannah Shaw took over our farm. And the Shaw family was really the family that shaped the farm to even a lot of the pieces that you see today. They're the ones who made the improvements on our house and gave the house its character that you see today. They're the ones who built this gigantic barn. In fact, you can even still see their signature right there, here in the underside of the barn. The Shaws mostly did dairy here on our farm. You know, that's why they built this gigantic multi-tier dairy barn. Like this room I'm in right now used to be the milk cooler room because they had so many cows and they had to store their milk and keep it cold. These days I use it as a room for brooding various baby birds. Say hi to the baby chick, you guys. Ooh. It really boggles my mind when I think about the Shaws and what they've built here. I mean, walking through this barn is just absolutely awe-inspiring. It feels like a cathedral to me. Right now, we're trying to do our best to preserve the barn, but the challenge is that a barn built at the end of the 19th century for a dairy operation does not necessarily match the needs of a waterfowl and tree farm here in 2019. But I'm trying to do the best that we can to preserve the past, while at the same time be ready and able to have a financially sustainable future as a farm. So Richard and Hannah Shaw eventually passed the farm down to their son Frank and his wife Nellie. And Frank and Nellie were really the, the heads of the farm from I think like the mid 19 teens, I think, that's a guess, for most of the, the mid 20th centuries. And they also actually established a boarding house here at the farm. And according to this here book, they announced a daily rate of $2.75 and a weekly rate of $14 to $17 to stay here at the farm. They would also host delightful Sunday chicken dinners. Interesting side note, one of the relatives of the Shaw family actually came and visited us last year. And when she did, she told us stories about how the Shaws used to keep chickens inside their house uh, during the dead of winter. I hope Allison doesn't get any ideas when she hears that story. As the 50s and 60s tumbled on, the Shaw family's engagement in agriculture tailed off. Nellie was getting on in age and she eventually sold the farm in 1976. Really in the 50s, 60s, and even into the early 80s, 
local farmers would rent this farm, including my neighbor Fran. He actually used to rent it and he has a ton of interesting stories. But I don't believe people have kept cattle here, especially in this barn since at least the early 80s. Which means that this giant pile of manure is probably older than I am. Look at that, that's crazy, right? So when the Shaw family sold the farm in 1976, uh, a couple from New York, the Sidons, they uh, bought it and, and really treated it as sort of like a weekend place. And they rented the land frequently to local farmers for haying or grazing cattle. But for the most part, its agricultural use went into hiatus. But the important thing that Margaret Sidon did before she sold the land was she took it and put it within the Vermont Land Trust. Now the Vermont Land Trust is a local nonprofit that tries to protect farmland and forest. And the conservation easement that they hold on our property means really a couple of things. Number one, we can never subdivide the property and, and develop the property. Number two, we can only ever use the property for forestry or agriculture. And number three, if I ever wanna build a structure outside of like the homestead area, right around the house and barn, I need to contact the Vermont Land Trust and get their permission. But the upside of all those restrictions ultimately means that the land is taxed a little bit differently and it makes it a little bit easier for a guy like me to hold on to such a large chunk of land. And when the Sidons ultimately sold the land, they sold it to a couple who were lawyers turned farmers. Sort of an experience I can personally relate to. The Griffin family took over the property in the early 2000s and they ran an organic vegetable CSA here on our farm. And because everybody locally here in Peachum knew this farm as the Shaw Farm, they kept the name and they branded their operation Old Shaw Farm. They ran that till I think about 2010 or so until they ultimately stopped all operations here and they moved to another home and then they put this place on the market. <laughs> Roughly three years ago, my wife Allison and I purchased this farm here in Peachum, Vermont. And for me, it was like a next step in the chasing of a dream. It had been vacant for nearly six years. It needed a ton of work. Still needs a ton of work? but it was the place that I had been dreaming about. You see, despite having no agricultural experience or background, I have this fakakta dream of someday having a thriving, profitable farm business. I'm one of those goofy people who believes that our food system today is fundamentally broken. And the only way that it's gonna get better is if people innovate and come up with new ways to farm. It will ultimately lead to a system that is better for the environment, that's better for the community and that's better for the farmer. And so that's why I quit a job in the investment world down in Washington DC to come up here and focus on starting this enterprise. Here on our farm, we have a couple of different enterprises going right now. We raise ducks. <laughs> they are just adorable goofy creatures that provide a ton of eggs and meat for us. And you can charge a premium for both those eggs and meat when compared to chicken. We raise geese for meat. They're just these awe-inspiring animals that create a very sustainable form of pastured poultry. More sustainable than chickens or ducks or turkeys because their diet is primarily based on grass. And we're trying to establish a 600 tree orchard to grow chestnuts, elderberries, mulberries, apples, and several other types of tree crops. Let me just stress that this is a baby orchard. Uh, startup orchard. Most of the trees right now are just sticks. They're uninspiring, but I hope someday they will grow. And I hope that they ultimately produce this long-term income stream for the farm that long surpasses me in my lifetime. And I'm also trying to build the brand and a customer base for the farm by developing content and education and sharing what we're doing here on our farm through social media. Like with YouTube videos like you guys are watching right here, right now. Now, most of these enterprises right now are losing money. And when I roll it all together, it's just barely, barely scraping by from a profitability standpoint. And none of the income is enough for me or my wife to live on. And so we both have to work off farm to make ends meet. But as I continue to add different enterprises to our farm and continue to build my own personal skill set and continue to build the brand and business of the farm, my hope is someday that this is going to be long term, sustainable, and profitable. It's got a soul. This here old farm. Falls asleep inside now. We walk the fields under the stars. The love is here in Gold Shop Farm. So as we work to start a farm here in Vermont, 
I feel really good knowing that I'm part of a very long tradition of agriculture here. Even though what we're doing at our farm might be laughable to some and is radically different than any other model of farming that's been here before us, I also know that if you look back over the history of our farm, there's been evolutionary turns at every single step. Those evolutionary turns mark the land and shift the landscape. And I'm excited to see where we end up. And I also really wonder what things will look like 20 years from now, 40 years from now, 100 years from now. I'm really curious to see what it becomes. I just sure hope it is a farm.